Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to another Portland Psychedelic Society event at the Clinton Street Theater! <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. My name is Evan. I am a board member here with the Portland Psychedelic Society, and I help volunteer organize these meetings. And, um, yeah, I, I am newly elected as the secretary, so um, that's a pretty cool position. I, I, I've been volunteering with this organization for about six months, and this is my first time hosting an event at the Clinton Street Theater. And this is a really special place to me, so I'm so happy that everyone's here um, to experience, experience this, and to experience the community of, of Portland Psychedelic Society. Portland Psychedelic Society is a nonprofit organization here in Portland, and we aim to educate and support people um, doing psychedelic research, and we aim to support the community that is looking to heal with these medicines. Uh, speaking of medicines, uh, we don't, um, we advise that you don't solicit or um, solicit substances or services within our meetings. Um, this is not the place to score. Um, it's also not the place to ask people to sit with you as you as you trip on these substances. Sorry. <laughs> Portland's cool, but it's it's not that cool yet. <laughs> which is why we're here. <laughs> um, Portland Psychedelic Society is going through going through a lot of changes lately. Um, and if you've been involved in the community for the past couple of years, you'll clearly see that. Um, uh, if you attended our last conference, it was a, it was a really, really huge uh, success. We, we had a, a lot of really talented speakers come in and present. And we're growing um, at an exponential rate. Portland Psychedelic Society is actually the second largest psychedelic society in the world. Um, Woo! <laughs> And uh, so we need help. We need help maintaining this growth. And so I just wanted to mention that if anyone's interested in getting involved with the organization, we're looking for volunteers. Um, it could be something as simple as helping running our merch table in an event like this, or it could be something as intense as helping organize events like what I'm doing right now, although I don't recommend this. <laughs> um, and we also have a, a pretty... A pretty substantial amount of support groups that are that are popping up. Um, you'll know if I see a couple faces here from the men's support group. Uh, we're also trying to put together a women's support group, a POC support group, a queer support group. And so I'm here to also ask that if you identify with any of those communities and you feel like you could take on the responsibility of opening up conversations about psychedelic medicine within those communities, then get in touch with me or another board member within Psychedelic Society. Um, and we'd love to work with you because we want this information to be accessible to as many people as possible in Portland. And we want to support this inclusive community of all you beautiful people. You know, we're, we're here for each other and um, it's going to take a little bit of work to, to set that up. But um, I hope you're as excited as I am to, to do that. Um, so without further poo -poo, I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, Aaron Eisen. He is a graduate at PSU, where he double majored in social science and in psychology. He's also a student intern of OHSU, participating in multiple research studies involving the brain. He's also a student intern at Dornbecker Children's Hospital. It's a long list, so this guy's amazing. Um, Aaron, Save the topic for like two more, two more bullet points. <laughs> He's also one of the main volunteers at the organization um, to my right. This is Northwest Noggin. They are a neuroscience outreach group designed to educate the community uh, in the Pacific Northwest of neuroscience research in creative ways. And as you'll see here, we have real human brains, neurotransmitters made out of pipe cleaners, uh, bobcat eyeballs. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So if you haven't seen it, um, after the presentation, Aaron will be doing a QA and a and we'll have time to answer questions and then also time to check out some brains if you haven't. And you can touch them if you want. You can touch them if you want. They have gloves. With you gloves. have to use gloves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gloves. 
Uh, and now, Aaron Eisen is studying at NUNM uh, as a grad student in the Integrative Medicine Research Program. This list goes on and on and on, but I'll just pass the mic to Aaron. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for coming out. It's just gonna be a second. I have to run up. Uh, we don't have a clicker, so I'm manning the projector up there. I forgot about that. I stood there and I was like, oh, that was so easy. Wait, I have more to do. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to thank the Portland Psychedelic Society for setting up this amazing event and inviting me to speak. I am honored to be here. I also want to thank every single one of you for taking time out of your day to come down and learn, talk, and find out new things about these amazing medicines. So, I'm starting uh, in the process of starting this new nonprofit organization called Translational Research and Psychedelics. The primary goal of this organization is to provide free education to people on psychedelics and eventually build in a research component to that. I hope to actually integrate this uh, new nonprofit organization into the Portland Psychedelic Society um, as an educational component of the Portland Psychedelic Society. <laughs> And yeah, as Evan mentioned, uh, we're going to have to be a little creative with how we're going to move from slide to slide. So I'm just going to say next slide, and then we'll move on. <laughs> so we're part of, uh, as Evan mentioned, there's a Northwest Noggin, which is right over here. Uh, they're an amazing outreach organization. We travel to K-12 public schools and other places in the community, such as youth correctional facilities, um, shelters that offer services to homeless youth, as well as uh, Native American tribal lands, and the list goes on. Uh, the primary goal of Northwest Noggin is to provide resources and give people um, access to education about something very important, our brain. <laughs> and we like to do that not through just going up and lecturing in front of people, but whenever we go into classrooms or these organizations, we ask people, what do, they already, what do you already know about the brain? What do you want to know about the brain? What is important to you? And we don't know what we're going to talk about before we go in front of uh, any audience. It's a really amazing opportunity. We also use a lot of uh, different methods to provide this knowledge to people, such as these uh, cool pipe cleaner neurons. We do a lot of different art projects. Um, we really try to integrate art into the way that we teach science, which is really, really important. Uh, these are some really cool pictures that we have of a bunch of different outreach events that we do, and all the excited kids that get to handle real brains. I can actually smell the Kerasafe solution. <laughs> <laughs> Which is surprising, because I know we don't smell it. We do a bunch of outreach. Thanks. Where were you this morning? Oh, yeah, just this morning we were at um, Douglas, David Douglas. David Douglas High School, and we were doing outreach with, must have been like 300 children? I bet 300 um, high school students. Yeah, 300 high school students. They had some really amazing questions about animal research and um, how different drugs affect the brain, how sleep affects the brain, and a really, really amazing opportunity. So at the end of this lecture, if you want to go ahead and pick up some brains and the ask some questions. The high schoolers were brain enough. <laughs> they, they were, yeah. <laughs> they all touched it. <laughs> they, they all touched it. <laughs> And um, yeah, we again want to thank you all for being here, and uh, part of the proceeds of this event will actually be donated to Northwest Noggin to help buy pipe cleaners, gloves, a whole bunch of other uh, tools to help support further outreach. Next slide. So Evan did a pretty good job of introducing me, so this is going to be pretty short. <laughs> um, again, I'm a graduate student at the National University of Natural Medicine studying integrative medicine research. And what integrative medicine is, is the combination of both traditional medicine that's been used for thousands of years and allopathic medicine, or what you would see if you went into your doctor today. It's to see how these medicines can be used together. And there's a particular interest in plant medicines and all kinds of natural medicines and psychedelics as well. Um, I'm a research assistant at Oregon Health and Science University in the School of Nursing. Belmont's Brain Imaging Lab, ADHD Research Study, uh, National Spina Bifida Registry, and the Alcohol Research Center. Um, that pretty much sums up 
well, how much I want to talk about myself. Let's move on to the actual thing. So I'm happy to share these slides with you. We're going to be covering a lot of information, and I understand it might be kind of difficult to digest everything in this short time that we have. So if you want to get a copy of these slides, I'm more than happy to send them to you, and you can kind of go over them at your own pace and email me if you have any questions. I'm also going to be talking about a lot of research that's being done on psychedelics now, and I'm happy to provide you with those articles. Unfortunately, a lot of research is uh, behind paywalls. They make you pay for these articles. It can be very expensive, 50 to $60 per article, which is just absolutely outrageous. Like, we've already paid for this research with our taxpayer dollars. Why pay twice? So I'm more than happy to provide this research to you free of charge. Or if you want me to get any other articles as well, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> we can go back a slide. Just ask the <laughs> So, um, just in the sake of time, I'm going to ask if we could please hold questions until the end of the presentation. Um, if I did a really bad job with explaining anything or something is completely unclear, feel free to kind of raise your hand and I'll try and elaborate on that a little bit more. But if we could, uh, at all possible, save the questions to the end. If you have like a smartphone, you can just text or type your question in the notepad and kind of be reminded of it later. And for any experts in the room, uh, it's going to be a little difficult to explain everything behind neuroscience in an hour, so some level of generalization will be applied to this uh, presentation. Next slide. Okay, disclaimer voice time. <coughs> the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of OHSU, PSU, NUNM, Northwest Dog, and Society for Neuroscience, the Imperial College of London, MAPS, and MAPS Canada. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> so let's go down the rabbit hole. Next slide. So your brain. Your brain is made of cells, and there's cells that all over your body. Specifically, there is a few types of cells in your brain. There are neurons, there are glia cells, there are a whole bunch of other ones. We're going to focus a little bit on neurons in this uh, presentation. But neurons specialize in communication. They send messages to one another through what's called a little synapse. So neurons actually don't touch each other. There's a little gap where neurotransmitters actually leave the axon terminal or the end of one neuron. And they enter, well, they don't actually go inside. I don't like that image as well. Um, they touch receptors and that causes the electrical signals to continue or not to continue. Um, and that's kind of how neurons specialize in communicating with one another. At one of my last meetings, um, I actually got a really interesting question. Somebody was like, okay, neurons talk to each other. Well, what do they say? <laughs> so they generally send one or two messages. They send an excitatory message, telling the message to continue on, or they send an inhibitory message, telling the, the neuron to stop sending the message down the chain. Next slide. So all hallucinogens, Oddly enough, act at one specific receptor. They, some of, they all act at other receptors too, but what defines them as a psychedelic is this one specific serotonin receptor, the 5-HT2A receptor. And just to break that down, 5-HT is serotonin. The 2A is the postsynaptic receptor. It's uh, one of 15 different serotonin receptors, and then R stands for receptor. And it seems that the stronger that a psychedelic binds to one of these receptors, the more potent it is. So here they have a, a little graph up here, and up at the top, um, for, on the left, is low potency versus high potency, and then here we have affinity for the receptor, how well it binds to it. So we have high affinity is high potency, low affinity is low potency. And we can see LSD is way down there, or extremely high affinity, it binds the receptor very well, which is why it's so potent. Um, when I first saw this, I was like, why is DMT all up there? That's kind of weird, because most people think of DMT as being one of the most powerful psychedelics. But if you think about the dose of DMT compared to LSD, you might take a, 100 milligrams of DMT in a dose versus you take micrograms of LSD. So if you took 100 milligrams of LSD, that would be quite an experience. <laughs> Next slide. So hallucinogens affect the gating of the brain. 
So you have this white structure on the brain called the thalamus, which kind of sits directly on top of the brainstem. And in fact, later, if you want to go uh, pick up a real brain, we'd be happy to point out the thalamus to you. And the thalamus sits in a very convenient area. Because it's right on top of the brainstem, it's responsible for sending messages to different parts of the brain. You can kind of think of it as the old telephone operators that would pull the dials out and send the messages to the right places. So hallucinogens actually shut down the thalamus. So messages go where they're not necessarily supposed to go. Next slide. So some of you might have seen this picture before. And what this is really saying is that thalamus is being shut down and new connections are occurring that not, are, not, are not normally there. This is why we kind of see things like synesthesia, where messages that would normally go to, say, the auditory cor cortex, where you pick up sound, would now go to the visual cortex, and you would actually have the ability to see sound and other things like that. Um, in the circle right here, the different colors are different lobes of the brain, and you can see when the thalamus is turned on and doing its job, a lot of the different uh, brain regions don't talk to each other that much. But under the influence of psilocybin, when the thalamus is shut down, you see this massive surge in connection, and all of a sudden the brain is talking to itself much more. There's this kind of uh, local integration and global disintegration, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Next slide. Hallucinogens also act on the locus ceruleus, which is your orientation network. So if you were to see, say, a spider running across the floor, you might be oriented towards the spider. Or if you were to step out into the middle of the road and you were to see a car coming at you really fast, you might be oriented towards that to tell you, oh, jump out of the way. So psychedelics kind of hijack this network, and they make you oriented towards things you might not normally be oriented towards, like this chair over here or your hand. It might suddenly become very, very interesting. <laughs> Next slide. So where are these receptors? Well, they're everywhere in the brain. They're in the neocortex, which is kind of these outer, outer region of the brain, the very wrinkly part. Um, they're in the olfactory bulb, which is responsible for smell. They're in the hippocampus, which is uh, related to memory. Uh, the basal ganglia as well, which plays a pretty significant part in the reward network of the brain. Uh, the thalamus, as I mentioned. The cerebellum, which is uh, back over here, which is responsible for a lot of things, but generally it's generalized as a movement, balance, emotion, regulation, also plays a role in that as well. Um, interesting fact, over 60% of the neurons in your brain are in the cerebellum. This tiny little area back there, they actually call it the second brain, as well as the, um, the brain stem and the spinal cord. Next slide. So the default mode network is also another important point that psychedelics seem to affect. So the default mode network is your rumination network. If you're thinking, okay, like what I want to eat for dinner tonight, or I have this day off next week, what do I want to do on this day off that I have next week. It's that network that kind of allows you to daydream almost. So psychedelics tend to shut down the default mode network, which promotes self-awareness um, deep and promotes mindfulness. And that's why it might be a little hard to plan out what you want to do next week in the middle of an LSD trip. <laughs> Interestingly, oh, Interestingly enough though, um, it seems that meditation also has the same effect of shutting down the default mode network, which is why mindfulness is often associated with meditation. So there are other ways to get these kinds of effects other than psychedelics as well, but psychedelics might be kind of a, an easy way to kind of access these effects. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk about the different kinds of psychedelics. We have the classical psychedelics, the pathogens and intactogens, the disassociatives, delirients, and the ominous research chemicals. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, this is just a trigger warning. I'm gonna be showing pictures of drugs. So if this is something that would bother you, this might be a good time to step out for a minute. Might not have been the best meeting to go to. <laughs> okay, we'll see the drugs. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> yeah, 
assume we're going to go on. So, uh, the classical psychedelics include all the ones we think of when we hear psychedelics. That's LSD, DMT, psilocybin, mescaline, and ibogaine. These are all 5-HT2A agonists, so they activate the 5-HT2A receptor. And up here we have psilocybin mushrooms, DMT crystals, ibogaine powder. Uh, this would be pure mescaline that's extracted, and then we have LSD blotters as well. Next slide. Then we have the impactogens and intactogens. Uh, these are include MDA, MDMA, MDAI, so on and so forth. Interestingly, they all start with M. Um, so these are really associated with kind of feeling open to other people, um, feeling connection with oneself and one's own spirituality. These are really relationship building medicines. Um, these also act on the 5-HT2A receptor, but they do a little more than that as well. Uh, they are reuptake inhibitors for serotonin, so they actually act as SSRIs. They are re reuptake inhibitors for no epinephrine, so they actually act as SNRIs. And they are also um, reuptake inhibitors for dopamine, which is the same thing that cocaine does. They also promote an oxytocin release, which is associated with kind of this feeling of openness and love and so on and so forth. Next slide. We have the dissociatives, which include pet of, uh, PCP, ketamine, uh, DXM, which is cough medicine, and salvia. Now these are NMDA receptor antagonists, so they block the NMDA receptor and kind of prevent that. And the NMDA receptor is responsible for a lot of different things. It plays a really important role in learning and memory. Uh, there's actually a really interesting experiment um, where they found that these receptors are open for longer periods of time in younger humans and younger animals. And they did this experiment where they took a young mouse's NMDA receptor and they put it in an older mouse. And they called this new mouse the, the doogie mouse. And the new mouse with the child and the NMDA receptors was better able to navigate through mazes and learn new things. So it plays a really important role in learning, but also just kind of realizing where you are. There's actually this uh, one lobe of the brain, the parietal lobe, which is responsible for what's called somatosensation, kind of knowing where your body is in space. For example, if I'm to close my eyes, I'm still able to touch my nose, even though I'm not physically seeing where I am. And this is that network. Um, and people, you can actually do brain surgery on somebody when they are conscious and awake because we do not have pain receptors in our brain. There was a really interesting experiment where they had a woman and that her brain was exposed and they were putting electrical stimulation in different regions. And they hit one network and the woman described feeling like she was being lifted out of her body, floating up over the room. And then they went and they took away the electrical stimulation. She got sucked right back in. So it seems that Disassociatives tend to act on that network and make you feel kind of dissociated from your body like you're no longer in there. They use ketamine uh, quite frequently in medical settings, especially with animals as tranquilizers. They actually do use them in humans though, during pregnancy, because it's not really when you want to feel like you're in your body <laughs> next to that. They are also, they are also uh, opioid receptors, which is really interesting as well. Next slide. And then we have uh, the deliriants, which are nutmeg, benadryl, dramamine, deadly nightshade, and datura. Interestingly, uh, most of these are all legal, uh, but I consider these to be one of the most uh, sinister of the psychedelic groups. Um, they are anticholinergic and antihistamine. Now, acetylcholine, which is associated with anticholinergic, uh, um, acetylcholine is at uh, it connects to the neuromuscular junction. So that's where your muscles connect to your nervous system. And this includes your heart. So taking too many of these can disrupt those connections and stop your breathing, stop your heart, so on and so forth, and it can be fatal. Uh, next slide. Then we have uh, the research chemicals, <laughs> which includes the DOX series, the NB series, the 2C series, so on and so forth. 
Um, these should definitely be taken with caution and be very uh, careful when we ever encounter these substances. They are very new. Um, some of them have only been around for a few years. And as such, we do not know the long-term effects of these substances on the brain. We don't really understand the full behavioral effects. A lot of them have not gone through clinical research trials. They've just been made by scientists in labs for a host of different reasons. So we have to be very careful when we're using uh, these kind of substances or we're going to counter them. This is actually a, a blogger tab of 2,5-I, and it might be kind of hard to see back there, but it says, uh, not for human consumption, plant food. I wonder what kind of plants they're growing. <laughs> Um, furthermore, if you're interested in research chemicals, I highly recommend this book, which I'm blocking, uh, TCAL. It's by Alexander Shulgin, who's created uh, many of the research chemicals, a lot of the 2C series, so on and so forth. Uh, he describes all the, a lot of the different substances he's created in there, and then he describes the subjective experience, which is, I, I love to read through it and just like read all the subjective ones. One really interesting is uh, DIPT, which is a chemical that he synthesized. Um, it's slightly similar to DMT, although interestingly enough, all of its hallucinations are completely auditory. And it's uh, quite intense. I believe in his book he was describing people sounding like frogs. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, furthermore, if you're more, if you're interested in kind of learning more about substances, I really recommend checking out Arrowhead. It's an amazing resource. They have a host of different information on what on virtually every substance is that is around. Um, yeah, like the list goes on and on and on. They must have over two or three hundred substances that you can get information on on this website. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the 5-HT2A receptor. So it's the main excitatory receptor. So it sends messages, turns things on. Among um, the serotonin, uh, serotonin subtypes of receptors. Although the 5-HT2A receptor might also have an inhibitory effect in certain areas of the brain, such as the visual cortex and the frontal cortex. And an interesting thing about the brain is if you shut down a part of it, the brain does not like that. It pulls information from adjacent areas. Um, people might have, I'm not sure if anybody's heard of the concept of phantom limbs, that's where when somebody loses an arm, they still feel that their arm is they get open and closer and move it. They still feel that it's connected there. It turns out that adjacent areas in the motor cortex actually bind to other areas, um, such as the cheek. So whenever the person were to, was to move their mouth, they would feel as if their hand was moving. A similar thing happens with hallucinations. So by the 5-HT2A receptor being activated, it shuts down regions of the visual cortex. And when those areas are shut down, there's gaps in the information that our brain is pulling in. And because of those gaps, our brain fills in those, that, those missing pieces with information from adjacent areas, which is how we experience hallucinations. Next slide. So the 5-HT2A receptor, there's lots of it. Um, many, it's expressed very highly in the cortex, which is associated with learning and memory retrieval. It's also concentrated in the postingular cingulate cortex, which is a major component of the default mode network, which is why we might see that being affected so heavily by psychedelics. It's not really found in the motor cortex, though, which might explain why somebody can take a rather high dose of psychedelics have a massive kind of cognitive effect, but they can still walk around and function. Um, it also seems to be activated in the stress response. Um, it improves cognitive flexibility, associative learning, and even allows for hippocampal neurogenesis, the growth of new neurons, which we're going to cover in a little bit. Next slide. Subjective effects of activating the 5-HT2A receptor include well-being, optimism, openness, ego dissolution, and it's really helpful when there's a need for flexibility to break rigid thought patterns or strongly held beliefs. Next slide. So this is some research that was done by Robin Carhart Harris, who's at the Imperial College of London. He's kind of leading the field right now on psychedelic research. 
he found that psychedelics was were associated with openness and liberalism, and this was not found with cocaine or alcohol. Furthermore, uh, he found psychedelics were associated with nature relatedness, which was defined as, I always think about how my actions affect the environment. He also found that alcohol was not associated with nature relatedness, which is fairly interesting. Whenever I think of uh, liberalism and nature relatedness, I kind of think of Portland. <laughs> so I'm not sure if psychedelics made Portland this way, but maybe because Portland is so interested in these things, it became a really kind of hub of attraction for psychedelics. There was also another very interesting study by Hendricks in 2014. And he found, he looked at, I believe it was 20,000 people who were incarcerated. And he looked at their, their psychedelic use uh, before they were incarcerated, obviously. And they found that psychedelic use was a greater predictor against recidivism, which is defined as going back to jail, than stable family, housing, and employment. Next slide. So there's a really kind of new movement that's going around about microdosing. So I'd like to cover that just a little bit. Um, there's a re new research study that came out, but before I kind of go into that, I want to cover some terms. There's convergent thinking, which is the idea of uh, persistence over flexibility, which might be kind of associated with like a conservative more mindset. And there's divergent thinking, which is flexibility over persistence, kind of this more liberal mindset. They found on a high dose of psychedelics, divergent thinking, so the idea of flexibility over persistence, liberal, kind of increased. Convergent thinking, kind of the more conservative, decreased, and creative, creativity increased. However, on a low dose of psychedelics, they found that both divergent and convergent thinking increased, as well as creativity. Next slide. So what this is kind of saying is that microdosing might kind of produce this optimal cognitive level of being able to kind of take in the environment, make decisions, so on and so forth. Uh, the 5-HT2A receptor also indirectly modulates dopamine. That means activating it causes a cascade of reactions that will also affect dopamine signaling. So microdosing is kind of pushes the brain towards the most efficient mind zone. There's enhanced motivation, focused. There's reduced distractibility, procrastination, and kind of the breaking of rigid thought patterns. This is a graph that I kind of made on uh, the idea of performance and function and dopamine levels. Just increasing dopamine does not necessarily mean increase in performance and function. Um, so the idea here is that as we kind of reach an optimal level of dopamine, we're going to see the highest rate of performance and function, which is kind of associated with microdosing. And that might be why we hear people in the Silicon Valley, Steve Jobs, so on and so forth, kind of using microdosing to kind of help them deal with roadblocks associated with co coding and other things like that. It might be useful in the uh, treatment of light depression as well. But then there's kind of this beneficial thing of this high dose kind of causing a whole reset to occur in the brain. That might be very beneficial for addictions treatment. Next slide. So I kind of already used, uh, introduced Robin Carhart Harris a little bit. Um, yeah, he has uh, quite a lot of publications and he's the head of the psychedelic research site, a uh, research program in the Imperial College of London. Um, so I went to a talk by him and he said some pretty amazing things, which I'd love to share with you now. Next slide. So serotonin is involved in neuronal plasticity. And what neuronal plasticity is, it's the brain's ability to change and adapt to new situations. Next slide. So serotonin is really involved in the sensitivity to context, environmental factors. How well can our brain adapt to our environment? So research in humans and animals has shown that manipulating serotonin can modulate an organ sensitivity to the environment. And this is just kind of the idea of 
um, plasticity. So if there was no plasticity that occurred in our brains, it wouldn't matter what environment we're in. Our brains would just kind of all develop the same way. But kind of what makes us who we are is we all grow up in different environments. We all have different experience. And this kind of all changes our brain and who we are. This is kind of what we see. Traits down here kind of morphing to the environment that we're in. Next slide. So how does serotonin relate to the environment that we're in? Well, research has shown that if you're in an enriched environment and you increase serotonin, that will increase the positive response to an environment. However, if you're in an adverse environment, increasing serotonin will not improve your mood and not make things better. In fact, it will increase the negative response. So this is kind of something that we have to consider when we give people SSRIs. And SSRIs goals are to increase serotonin in the brain. But if the person's in an adverse environment, this is not ideal. This will increase kind of this negative response and reaction. And SSRIs have been shown to be rather effective, but we have to consider who is going in to get this treatment. Is it people that can afford it? Is it people who are have health insurance rather than the people who are in more adverse adverse environments, maybe out on the street, homeless, in prison, so on and so forth. Like, would these medicines really benefit them? Not according to the, our research. Um, there's also a re really interesting study called Rat Park, um, where they took mice and they had them in these cages, which I would describe as being an adverse environment. They were alone, nothing to play with, just a bare cage. And they were given morphine. And the mice would consume the morphine until they died. But the researchers had this idea. They were like, what if we build a rat Disneyland? Give them a bunch of things to play on, give them a bunch of friends to hang out with, a whole bunch of cheese, like a whole bunch of different things to enjoy. And they gave them the choice of water or morphine. And interestingly enough, the rats barely touched the morphine when they had this enriched environment, when they had all these friends to play with when they had th other things to do. Next slide. So what this is saying is, we know serotonin is involved in mood, but it's complex, the relationship between that. And it really depends on what kind of environment you are in. These increasing serotonin does not necessarily increase a positive mood. It really stresses the importance of context. Next slide. So what happens when we activate the 5-HT2A receptor under psychedelic use. As I mentioned before, we have low-level associative learning, extinction learning or unlearning, flexibility of behavior and thought patterns, and on a phys uh, physiological level, we actually have neuroplasticity in the cortex, which is the growth of new neurons, even as adults. We also have synaptogenesis, which is the growth of new connections of the neurons, new dendrites, new axon terminals, new branches that are kind of reaching out, which is what we can see here in this slide. It's a neuron reaching out, trying to grab and make a connection to another, so that would be synaptogenesis. Next slide. So how does the 5-HT2A receptor, how is it related to us when we're not understanding it? Why is it there? It's very, very important with human development. And it's expressed less with older age. And this is really important because it's expressed much more when we were younger to allow us to soak up information like a sponge. So more plasticity early on when an individual is learning so much is very, very important. Like a sponge absorbing new experiences. Next slide. So when we take a psychedelic and we activate the 5 ht 2 a receptor, we have this breakdown of specialization. When we're young, we're actually born with 200 billion neurons. But by the time we're age 24 to 26, we only have 86 billion of them left. We lose almost half our brain cells during development. And this really relates to the kind of environment, or well, this helps um, to improve functions. Because who can do more, an infant or an adult? An adult can do more. 
And as these neurons tend to, they find where they're supposed to go and where they can send messages. And they kind of help to specialize in certain areas. And they, based on what you do, that's where these neurons tend to go and start to make new connections. There's actually a research that has shown if an infant is kept in a dark room from age zero to age five with absolutely no light, no light the brain will think that vision is not necessary in its environment, and it'll snip all the connections to the eyes and the person will be blind for the rest of their life. So this is really important in specialization. So when you're young and you have all these brain cells, you don't jump to conclusions as much. You're really able to kind of see the big picture. And as we grow older, we start to lose these neurons, and that helps us to make quick decisions based on our past experiences. Although that kind of leads to adults jumping to conclusions. Sometimes kids can kind of look at the decisions that adults are making and they're like, why are you doing that? <laughs> so when we take a psychedelic, we actually see a system regression. Developmentally older brains start to look like younger brains. We kind of see a breakdown in these jumping to conclusions and we see a global integration and a local disintegration. So what that means is overall, like more regions of the brain start talking to each other, kind of like how we saw in that picture with the psilocybin uh, much earlier. And brain regions that don't normally talk to each other as much kind of stop doing that. Next slide. So again, why is the 5-HT2A receptor there? It's not just there for psychedelics. It's actually turned on naturally during times of stress. And that helps to make us more adaptable and think on our toes. So again, during times of stress, when we need to be thinking on our toes, especially when we need to be adaptable to survive, that is when the system engages and it improves our chances of survival. Next slide. So now we're gonna, now that we've done a little background on psychedelics, I think we're all ready to graduate on and talk a little bit about how they can affect different psychopathologies inside of our brains. Next slide. So I'm gonna go over the current research for MDMA to treat PTSD as well as psilocybin to treat depression. Next slide. So let's first start about talking. MDMA to treat PTSD. Next slide. So this was from a talk by Mark, Mark Hayden, who's the director of MAPS Canada. He's an adjunct profession, professor at the University of British Columbia. He has a history in social work, nursing, medicine, public health, and 28 years in the addictions field. So I'm gonna share some of the knowledge that I got from his talk with all of you. Next slide. So classical psychedelics offer a sense of generic spirituality. And what do we mean by generic? Well, it's whatever your belief system is, is what is manifested. Christians find Christ, Buddhists find the Buddha, and atheists find the entire universe. If you believe in the snake and the vine, you will find the snake and the vine. Next slide. So this is incredibly helpful in the treatment of many different issues. There's a disorientation of one's ego when one's fundamental sense of self changes. This is very useful for the treatment of alcoholism. If it's one's ego that is persuading one that it is acceptable to drink 26 ounces of vodka every day, that belief system needs to be disoriented. Next slide. And classical psychedelics are useful for this. They're unconscious amplifiers. They help us to access materials in our unconscious mind. The permeability between the conscious and unconscious mind becomes less. We can dig deeply into ourselves to find stuff. And if issues are in our unconscious mind, we can find them and we can rework them. Next slide. There's also the portal effect, the wow, that was incredible effect. Like climbing Mount Everest or graduating from the university, it's a major sense of accomplishment, achievement, 
and transition. And that is useful in treating substance use disorders, in helping with withdrawal and detox, depression, and anxiety disorders. Next slide. So we have the empathogens and the intactogens. And pathogens being connection with others. This includes MDMA, MDA, 3MMC. And these kind of uh, promote an intense bonding with others. And then we have the intactogens, which are connection with oneself. Next slide. This also stresses the importance of the therapeutic alliance. The therapeutic alliance is the greatest predictor of success in any orientation of psychotherapy. And these are alliance building medications. They help to, one, to reflect on oneself. They help to reduce the fear of PTSD treatments. PTSD is like a tape loop that is buried in our unconscious minds. As traditional therapists get close to that tape loop, there's a huge fear response. And MDMA reduces that fear and allows the person to confront this tape loop. And as such, MDMA is a state-of-the-art treatment for PTSD. Next slide. So Michael Mithoffer, who is an MD, was, and who works for MAPS, was really interested in how does M uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD differ than other forms? So he went to a really interesting conference, next slide, uh, called the Canadian Military Health Conference in Vancouver, British Columbia. And what this conference was, it was different scientists and psychologists who were pitching PTSD treatments to the military. And they claimed, at best, a 25% level of effectiveness. The literature says a little bit closer to 10%. And it takes years, the dropout rate is high because veterans do not want to re-experience their trauma. Flood, uh, such as with treatments like flooding or prolonged exposure. Sending a war vet to re-experience their trauma and desensitize is a very, very difficult experience and a challenging process. Next slide. So Michael Mithoffer demonstrated an 83 percent level of effectiveness. That's from 10, realistically 10, to optimistically 25, to 83 percent. Now if you're a researcher and you see somebody come up with a claim, there's one thing you're going to say. They're lying. They falsified their data. There's a problem with the methodology. This can't be true. At best, there are generally 5% increments or increases when we see new treatments come out of their effectiveness. So MAPS went ahead and they got a larger sample, much more diverse, across several different countries in their stage two clinical trials, and they demonstrated a 67% level of effectiveness. Next slide. Uh, this is the paper that they uh, published, and I'd be happy to send that to you if you want to get my email, either you took it before or talk to me afterwards, I'm happy to send you this paper. Next slide. Now we're going to talk a little bit about psilocybin to treat depression. Next slide. So depressive disorders, they're actually the leading cause of disability in the United States, and 16 million people had a depressive order in 2015. Although I kind of raised my eyes, eyebrows to that statistic. Like, how did they really get that statistic? Did they survey everybody in the United States? No. I, I believe it's probably quite a bit higher than that even. Next slide. So Robin Carhart Harris did an experiment with psilocybin to see how it could treat depression. So he enrolled 20 subjects with treatment-resistant depression. And I, I hate the name treatment-resistant. It sounds like they're resisting the treatment. No, the treatment did not work for them. And treatment-resistant depression is uh, technically defined as the failure of two different classes of medication. But an interesting thing about these participants is 
They were depressed on average, each one of them, for 20 years. So this was extremely severe depression. And I'm sure in those 20 years, they tried a lot more than just two different types of medication. They probably tried everything that was available, every form of psychotherapy, but they were still defined as being in a clinical severe state of depression. So he used the Quick Inventory of Depressive Symptoms, Symptomology, which is a survey measure that shows both a high level of internal consistency and validity. Um, and he did a one-week experiment, two doses, um, not every single day, just on day one and day seven. The first dose was a very small one. It was a light dose just to see if the people could tolerate the experience. And then the therapeutic dose was given on day seven. Next slide. So this is a little uh, calendar that I created just to better visualize um, what happened in the trial. So on the first day, they gave them a 10 milligram dose of psilocybin. There was no psilocybin given for the rest of the week. And then on day seven, they gave them a 25 milligram dose. And then they looked at their brain afterwards to see what was different in their brain from before. Now, one week after the 25 milligram dose, everybody had a reduction in their depression. And three weeks after the 25 milligram dose, nine of the 20 people were classified as being in full remission, which is defined as no depressive symptoms that were measurable by a clinical level. So that's, that's absolutely astounding. If these people have been depressed for 20 years on average and tried everything available, and then a one-week trial, half of them no longer had depression in a clinical measure. Next slide. So what happened in the brain? Well, people who research depression like to look at a region called the amygdala, which is very important for emotional regulation. It's often generalized as being responsible for negative emotions, kind of the fear response, but it does a little bit more than that. So they found a decreased blood flow in the amygdala, which is associated with a decrease in depression. But interestingly enough, they found an increase in reactivity of the amygdala, which was really puzzling. And this is the opposite of what we see and what the goal of SSRIs are to do. SSRIs try to reduce the amygdala's reactivity, and people often don't really like that. It kind of numbs all their emotions. They kind of describe feeling like zombies. But psychedelics seem to do the exact opposite. Um, to test amygdala reactivity, there's this very common test. It's a uh, response to different faces. They show the people happy faces down here and then more fearful faces, and they see how does the amygdala respond to that. And they found that the amygdala was more reactive to both the fear faces and the happy faces. And the researchers quantified that as an acceptance of all emotions, both good and bad. And we have to remember, these people have been depressed for on average 20 years, so they were very used to feeling these negative emotions. But the feelings of the good emotions, the positive emotions going through, that probably changed the game for them. Next slide. They also looked at the good old default mode network, which I mentioned earlier. So they found the functional connectivity of the default mode network increased, which is really odd, because as I mentioned earlier, when you take a psychedelic, during the, uh, when you're undergoing the trip, your default mode network shuts down. But it turns out, after the psychedelic experience, it turns back on with a vengeance. It starts increasing in connectivity. And interestingly enough, this functional connectivity increased only in the nine people who went into full remission, which really kind of states that it might be associated with the clinical outcome. And Increase in functional connectivity of the default mode network is also the therapeutic outcome of electroconvulsion therapy. But if you ask me, I'd rather take a mushroom than get shocked. <laughs> that might just be me, though. Next slide. 
So we also talked about the subjective effects. Increasing cognitive flexibility, this increase in well-being and optimism, but also an increase in the mystical experience, which was correlated with well-being and optimism, and had a negative correlation, meaning that as mysticism rose, depressive symptoms decreased. Next slide. So the mystical experience of these substances is one of the greatest predictors of success in the treatment of psilocybin, and that really depends on how much of a mystical experience do they have. So again, the degree of the mystical experience is often highly correlated with the outcome. People with the strongest experiences often have the greatest effects. But how do you measure mysticism? Well, there are certain surveys out there, such as the newest one is the 30 item revised mystical experience questionnaire developed by uh, Barrett, John, Johnson, and Griffiths. It both has a high level of validity and internal consistency. Um, and next slide. So Griffiths uh, did a very interesting study on mysticism. He gave participants, or he separated participants into two groups, a treatment group, which took psilocybin, and a control group, which took methylphenidate, Ritalin. And he measured their mysticism. He measured it before, directly after, two months later, and then 14 months later. And they asked the participants, did you have any positive mood changes? An increased sense of spirituality? How, and how personally meaningful and spiritual was this experience for you? So they measured it before, and they measured it right after, and the numbers went up. And then they measured it two months later, and the numbers went up even more. And then, next slide. Oh, this is the paper, in case you want me to send it to you. Next slide. <laughs> and then, 14 months later, the numbers went up even more. Next slide. And this is a groundbreaking study. Can you think of any intervention a psychologist, psychiatrist, or doctor does to anyone that you wait 14 months and remeasure and the number goes up from a single treatment? When administered under supportive conditions, psilocybin occasion experiences, like spontaneously occurring mystical experiences that at 14 month follow up were considered by the volunteers to be among the most personally meaningful and spiritually significant of their lives. Next slide. When they asked them why did this treatment work for you, the participants said they went from a disconnect to a connect. They went from an avoidance of difficult emotions to an acceptance. And they said that CBT and antidepressant treatments reinforced this connect, feeling like they are being passed from therapist to therapist without any real benefits. Next slide. So some metaphors for this would be a calm after a storm, a broader perspective, a reset. Next slide. Flexibility, a mind lubricant, if you will, and reconnection. Next slide. So I kind of like to think of it like this. Uh, during the acute state of psychedelics, when somebody is going in the middle of a trip, I kind of like to think of it as hot molten metal. That might not be the best time to apply a psychotherapy intervention. But afterwards, when the brain is resetting from this experience, that might be a good time to kind of apply these psychotherapy interventions when the brain is malleable and you're able to kind of shape it to better uh, accept these kinds of treatments. Next slide. <laughs> Now we're going to talk a little bit about, well, we've learned that these medicines can be very good, but there also are some dangers associated with them. <laughs> you've probably seen this guy before. And this is one of my favorite articles. Girl gives birth to a frog, and doctors blame LSD. So there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about the dangers of psychedelics that are out here, and I hope to shed some light on that.
Next slide. So overall, if we talk about toxicity and addiction dependence, psychedelics are very, very safe in that regard. They both have a low addiction potential, and you need a very, very large dose of them to be toxic. Here is a scale. So right down here, we have active dose over lethal dose. So how much of a dose do you need to feel something versus how much of a dose do you need to kill you? And then here we have dependence potential. Depend we see that LSD and psilocybin are way down there, even less than marijuana, caffeine. Um, and then we see other things up here. And it's kind of interesting to me that more of the legal things tend to be kind of up here in this range. It's always puzzled me. Next slide. So how can we be safe while using these medicines in a therapeutic or non-therapeutic setting? Well, um, I recently went to a MAPS training session, a Zendo product training session, which is their harm reduction initiative, and they had some... So they said, do your homework and clean your room. And what they mean by that is, if you have a lot going on, it might not be the best time to undertake a psychedelic experience. It might be better when you're in a more clear state of mind and don't have a lot of pressing responsibilities, like, oh, I gotta pick up my kid in a few hours. <laughs> and they describe the psychedelic experience as kind of like a bridge. Once you get on, you don't get off. You cross it and you go to the other side. Attempting to stop a trip could be quantified as telling somebody to jump off a bridge. So the idea is kind of go with the flow rather than to struggle against it. And this kind of really comes to mind when you see people running around at festivals, having the time of their life, and like an hour or two later you see them in the back of the squad car. Like, and they're given some kind of pharmacological intervention to stop the trip. Like that can that can be very devastating to people, psychologically and potentially physically as well. So always be safe. Please do not drive a vehicle or operate heavy machinery. It's always great to have a trip sitter there to kind of help you. Uh, per preferably if they're not intoxicated as well. Uh, it's always good to be in a familiar area and have a safe space that you can go to. Maybe a spot that you can be alone, that you feel comfortable in, in case things start getting a little weird or intense. It can be good just to kind of have that area that you can kind of recollect yourself in. And always, please, test your substance because it is not always what you believe it to be especially with the research chemicals that are coming out right now, you, a lot of people can purchase them for very cheaply online. And because of that, there's a rather large incentive for not so great people to sell them falsely as the psychedelics that we hope they are. And as such, there have been some rather unfortunate fatalities associated with that. So please always test your substances. And it's always good to remember that difficult is not the same as bad. Next slide. Now, if you're a trip sitter, it's always better to practice soft gazing rather than staring somebody directly in the eyes. <laughs> Animals generally associate that as a threat. Somebody under psychedelics might not take that so well. And kindly remind the person of their surroundings. Like, hey, this is great, but let's get off the road right now. Or I love your energy, but let's not disturb our neighbors. Can we maybe uh, tone it down just a few notches? Another thing is uh, only offer what you can provide. Um, one of the people who was leading the map session said that when he went to a festival, one of his first times, he'd walk up to people and be like, can I get you anything? And the person was like, yeah, I want a unicorn. <laughs> so it's good to offer what's available at your disposal. like. You want a, a blanket, some food, a water, some, a hug? Also, it's good to, as the trip sitter, to prevent situations that may lead to future regret for the person. Like, I want to call my boss and quit, or I want to call my mom right now. Po possible response to that might be like, oh, that, that's great, that's awesome. Um, 
why don't you write down how you're feeling right now, and if you still feel that way tomorrow, then go ahead and do it. And if the person is having trouble with the come down, art is actually a very useful tool to kind of channel that energy. Um, the, again, the person at the Zendo Project said that he sat with people in the tent, and they are like, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. He gave them uh, some crayons and an art pad, they started doodling 20 minutes later, knocked out, totally asleep. And if the situation is out of your control, obtain help. Do not try and stuff it out. This is how bad things happen. And be the spokesperson for them and whoever comes to help you. Tell them what is going on, what the person consumes, and try and help the person through that. Next slide. So just kind of a, a summary of that. Safe space, very important. You're sitting with the person as a trip sitter, you're not guiding them. Through, not down. And difficult is not the same as bad. Next slide. Okay, we'll see if this one works. Um, this is an interesting case of a person, a 17 year old male, who consumed a research chemical and had a very negative reaction with it. Let's see if uh, we can get the audio clip to play. Yeah, so uh, I woke up, I took my uh, Accutane as prescribed for my doctor, and then about 12 hours later, I decided to try this new drug with my friends called uh, 25i. And I didn't know much about it, I just heard it was like stronger than acid, and, I, and I've taken like, you know, psychedelics regularly, so I, you know, I thought I could handle it and stuff. Um, I remember when I took it, it just, it made my whole face completely numb and it just had this really gross metallic taste. It's really like synthetic tasting, but um, yeah, I didn't think much of it. Moments later, I immediately started feeling effects like vibrant colors, jitteriness, like just anxious. And uh, my friend was asking me, oh, are you good? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm all good. I'm just, I'm just really high, like really fast. And like, this was weird because normally psychedelics, in my experience, they've take like, they've taken like 45 to almost like 90 minutes to kick in. And this was imme this was almost immediately. Um, so uh, the visuals start getting more and more intense and I, I begin to panic. I then start to see like cop lights in my house and um, then I get paranoid like, oh, am I being too loud? Like they know, they must know. Um, so I just tell my friends like, I I'm just going to crash, I'm just going to go to bed. You know, I thought sleeping would make me feel better. Um, so I got under the covers and that's when everything got really crazy. I just, I just kept waking up, waking up confused, like each scenario more bizarre than the last. And I remember just not being able to come up with a coherent sentence or thought and everything was all jumbled up like a word salad of real and not real words that had no relation towards each other were just forming in my head. And I just couldn't, I couldn't communicate to my friends that I was, I was messed up and I couldn't, I thought I, I thought I gave myself a permanent brain damage and that's when I started really confused and yeah that that went on for a long time and <clears throat> and uh, then I, I heard this really loud static noise that just kept building gradually it just kept getting louder until it filled the room and and it, I just felt so much pain and just scared and just terror and just I thought this is the end this is what dying feels like I'm I'm dying right now um and I felt really guilty and really sad because at the time I was like 17 and I, I was just, I was like a month away from graduating and I was thinking, oh, how did, how could I go out like this? And, you know, how could I let my dad down? And, uh, <clears throat> and I think somewhere after that, that's when my, my friend tried to calm me down and he tried to offer me a banana. And, uh, that's, that's, that's when I, I got really, really religious at that point. Cause I thought I was dying. And I, at that point I went back to thinking, Adam and Eve, and it's really strange, but, you know, when Satan was, you know, trying to get 
Eve said the apple, I kind of thought in the same sense, so I, I, I grabbed the banana and I attacked him with it, and then it took about like three of my friends to take me down, and uh, that's that's kind of when I lost myself and went to another void, and, and then when I came to, I saw my dad, who at the, now I know that isn't, isn't, wasn't my dad at the time, but yeah, he, he was there and he was crying and he was like, my boy, my boy, what happened to my boy? And I felt so guilty. That's when I felt just like complete shit. I just like, yeah, I just, uh, you know, it was really, really hard to see your parent cry, especially over you and you're dead. And, and yeah, I saw the whole, you know, I saw the paramedics come in. I got zipped up in a bag and I saw myself from like a third bird eye view and it was really real, and I, I truly thought that I had died, and I just messed everything up, and that was it. And I, you know, that I'd just be known as the kid who died at 17 year, years old. Um, and it, that went on for just like, it felt like eternity. eternity. And um, it just, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh uh, yeah, uh, and, then, uh, and then I got naked, because I thought that's the only way that I could get raptured. Um, that, at the time it made sense, but yeah, I got, I got naked and uh, I jumped out of the window, or at least I tried to. Um, I got halfway out and the other half of me naked just kind of dangled in the living room. Um, and uh, eventually I just came to. Um, what helped was, I, towards the end, I think my sister was playing the guitar and <laughs> it was so funny, I was so high and so gone and no one could get through to me, but my sister playing it this hard, singing like a Bob Marley cover, but it, like she put my name in it, uh, like it was like Nico Don't Cry or something like that in the Bob Marley type uh, deal, but uh, that was the only thing that broke through and made me feel comfortable, which was so bizarre and strange, and I just, yeah, I thought I was at my own funeral, my own wake. Uh, yeah, it lasted for at least, I mean, they said I was like that for five, six hours, screaming at the top of my lungs, and my neighbors, like, you know, laughing, and my sister, you know, defending me, and, yeah, that's it, that's all I got, thanks a lot. <laughs> I don't know if the neighbors were laughing. <laughs> so, yeah, that's some pretty intense stuff. So, it turns out what happened there, in the beginning, he said he took Accutane. Turns out there was an interaction between 2-5-I and the Accutane, and the person was not aware of this. I mean, there was no research on 2-5-I, especially interactions in the human population. Next slide. So 2-5-I is a new psychedelic hallucinogen that was used in biochemistry for mapping the brain's 5-HT2A receptor. And it is more potent than a lot of other psychedelics. In fact, it is 16 times the potency of 2CI. And this was never essentially meant to be used as a recreational substance. It was used to study this receptor. It was discovered in 2003 by a chemist in Berlin for his PhD dissertation. Next slide. So, Again, 2,5-I has somewhat similar effects to LSD, although people often report more negative effects associated with it. And the recreational use of it uh, contains some really significant risks, including pharmacological and, as we heard, potential behavioral <laughs> toxicity. Um, and it's, as it's relatively new, you know very little about it and how it interacts with other substances. Next slide. So Accutane is a medicine that's used for the treatment of severe acne, although it's listed as a black box medicine, meaning the most serious warning regarding side effects. Um, there's been associated with people who use Accutane committing suicide and other things like that. Next slide. So it turns out that 2,5-I in of itself, that Accutane can be deadly. Um, it can lead to blood platelet aggregation, leading to cardiac arrest, even at one, like recreational doses, like not that high, like one or two hits. And the interaction between 2,5-I and um, Accutane seem to actually affect the very same receptor subtypes, so they directly related to one another. 
So this really stresses the importance of the dangers of research chemicals. We don't know what kind of medicines they're going to interact with, what kind of moods, what kind of emotions, which is why we have to be. I don't recommend using them, but anybody who does needs to be very, very careful. And furthermore, that really stresses the importance of testing your substances, because you might think it's LSD or something like that, but it might actually be 2,5-I. Next slide. So, in the uh, sake of time, I'm going to go through this a little quickly. <laughs> so, this is kind of my advice if you're interested in being a psychedelic researcher or a clinician. Next slide. So, psychedelics are still heavily stigmatized. There's no obvious infrastructure which enthusiasts can channel their energy. There's no psychedelic research graduate programs, meaning you cannot get a degree in psychedelic research. Um, there are no psychedelic student groups, scholarships, and very few professors are willing to provide mentorship or funding to sponsor such research. Next slide. So why, you also have to consider why you're interested in becoming a psychedelic researcher. It's because you think they're novel and cool? Well, you'll probably get bored pretty quickly because this takes a long time to do research. Um, is it because you had a mystical, life-changing experience? Well, you can keep having them. You don't necessarily have to do research on it. Is it because you're frustrated living in a culture that tramples individual freedoms, discourages introspection, insight, substitute lies and half-truths for genuine science? Well, there's other ways to be an activist other than a psychedelic researcher. Next slide. Or, is it because you are motivated by a genuine curiosity about these particular substances and wish to apply the tools of modern inquiry towards understanding their properties. Maybe you know the discovery of LSD is what sparked interest in the serotonin syndrome and prompted the explosive growth of modern psychopharmacology that continues today. Possibly, you contemplate what other hidden treasures lie within the mystery box of psychedelics. I think that's a pretty good reason to be a psychedelic researcher. Next slide. Are you willing to accept that your unconventional interests may lead to professional isolation, even ostracism, and that time-consuming navigation through the layers of red tape endemics to psychedelic research will inevitably slow your publication rate and promotions compared to your peers? And are you aware that a total lack of government or corporate support for such endeavors means that you will never be rich and you may even end up in jail? Next slide. If so, <laughs> as an undergraduate, get your degree, lie low and infiltrate the system. Educate yourself about psychedelics, such as meetings like this. Portland Psychedelic Society is a great place. Uh, start a psychedelic student group. Volunteer the North, Northwest Noggin. Uh, of course, Portland Psychedelic Society, we need new volunteers. Uh, Oregon Psilocybin Society, write letters to your congressman. As a graduate student, your first stop should be the Heffler Research Institute, which has a bunch of psychedelic allies in the international field. Next slide. So what degrees should you get if you're interested in being a psychedelic researcher? Well, a PhD in pure neuroscience or neuropharmacology is very valuable, as we see. Neuroscience is very much associated with psychedelics. Experimental psychology, the study of the human mind, is also useful. Clinical psychology will allow you to build the skills necessary in multi multidisciplinary teams researching the therapeutic value of psychedelics. Also, the idea of psychoanalytic training is quite valuable as well because that really has the idea of the unconscious mind which is something we discussed a little bit earlier, how psychedelics are really amplifiers of the unconscious mind. And cognitive science is a pure science of the mind, drawing from a variety of disciplines, and even computer science might be very useful in the study of psychedelics. Also, English majors, uh, people who are interested in kind of literature, other things like that, would be very, very valuable in the field. Next slide. There are many paths to becoming a psychedelic researcher, but in the end, what matters most is that you obtain success and satisfaction on a personal, professional, and spiritual level, while at the same time remaining true to yourself and your beliefs. Next slide. So you want to be a clinician. Well, I'm 
bias towards research, so I don't have as many slides on that, but explore a training program and degrees in transpersonal oriented psychotherapy. That seems to be the main type or orientation of psychotherapy that is being applied um, in the psychedelic realm. That's what uh, MAPS is training people on who want to be MDMA clinicians. Uh, there's also the California Institute of Integral Science. Uh, they offer a certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. Um, again, as I mentioned, there's MAPS, which is doing an MDMA, ther uh, MDMA therapy training program. Furthermore, a Zendo, product Zendo project training session um, is a really, really good opportunity to kind of learn more about how to be um, helpful to people who are undergoing the psychedelic experience. And once you go through one of your training sessions, you can actually volunteer with MAPS at uh, different festivals and help people who are having difficult experiences uh, have a good outcome from that. You can also start your own practice as a holistic therapist. Um, there's lots of people who have practices in Mexico and take patients down there to do different things like Ibogaine and other things like that. And above all, practice self-care. And I personally recommend staying within the law to avoid unnecessary consequences. Although somebody brought up a very good point at one of the other meetings that people are, are dying from PTSD, depression every day. We know these medicines help people, so why wait for our government to catch up? And who knows what that will be, especially with our current <laughs> government administrations that are currently around. Um, I'm just not personally gonna recommend anybody doing anything illegal. So it's really your choice and what you wanna do on that. Next slide. Thank you. <laughs> some time left. Um, I guess what we'll do is um, I could do a quick Q&A session, but if you are burning to go check out some brains, feel free to jump up and go look at the brains. I'm sure we can uh, do all of the above. So. So we don't have a huge amount of research on that because generally when we're trying to research the efficacy of psychedelics, we try and isolate the effect of psychedelics itself. If we were to take them in conjunction with a SSRI, then that would um, kind of not, we wouldn't be able to better isolate the actual effects of psychedelics. So I haven't seen a whole lot of research come out that has people who are undergoing SSRIs take these medicines. Um, that would definitely be kind of an avenue for future research. Um, I could definitely see potential benefits and drawbacks as well. There's a thing called serotonin syndrome, uh, which we have to be very careful of. Um, SSRIs block the reuptake of serotonin, so more is the synaptic cleft. And if we take a medicine that, incre that looks like serotonin, and that will increase the amount of serotonin there. So we might have to proceed with caution in that area, but it, they might also have therapeutic benefits mixing them together. But I haven't seen a lot of research on that specifically. Aaron. Aaron. We're good? Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, Aaron, this comes from a friend of mine. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, awesome. uh, she says, my curiosity was the interact interaction effect of microdosing on a brain that's had vascular surgery and treated with anti-seizure medications. Oh, very interesting. Um, well, a lot of vascular medication, especially anti-seizure medicine, will try and reduce uh, the flow of what's called glutamate. So glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter, and that's generally what causes seizures, is kind of this over-excitation of glutamate kind of flooding the brain. So 
I would really recommend, I would, I would say what psychedelic she's tending to microdose on. Psilocybin, okay, that, I would not recommend a thing like a dissociative um, microdosing on that, like ketamine or PCP or other things like that. Um, in general, I, I don't really have the research behind that, but I do not believe there would be a negative interaction from taking anti-seizure medicine for psychedelic and microdosing on psychedelics. Um, it's really, it would probably be a good idea to start off small and slowly work our way up until she starts to feel the beneficial cognitive effects. Um, there are definitely a few people out there, such as uh, James Fadiman, and um, as well as a few other researchers who kind of recommend kind of the dosing schedule, like once every four, four days in a row, and then a day off, or kind of other variations of that as well. Um, but overall, um, is she just microdosing to kind of improve cognitive flexibility or something like that, or is it for a disorder? She's still looking at the possibility. She hasn't uh, started experimenting with it yet. Okay. I, again, I don't actually have research behind that, but I do not believe that that would be a major danger. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I'd be happy, again, if anybody has any question that I can't answer, because I might not be able to answer all of them, you can email me and I can do a research and then send you any articles that I find that are related to your question. Um, I, I feel you. <laughs> um, I'm not really interested in like being a really spiritual person. And is there like any? Are there people who don't get the spiritual side of like side of things that still have helpful effects for depression? Absolutely, great question. So that's kind of what I was mentioning earlier about a sense of generic spirituality. You don't necessarily have to believe in a certain religion or even be agnostic. It's just this mind-expanding properties. So kind of the sense of, it, if you don't feel like, from my, speaking kind of from my experiences anyway, like I don't really identify with one religion or another, but I feel this openness and connection with other people. Like I feel this oceanic connectedness, connectedness with the world and just who I am. And a lot of people can feel segregated from their world for a whole host of different reasons. Maybe it's their sexual orientation. They don't feel that that's being officially represented. Maybe they just feel like climate change is going to kill us all. Like what's happening? So it's just kind of that idea that we are connected with who we are in the world. So I think absolutely it could be beneficial with even if somebody is not spiritual. Hi, I've got actually two, two separate questions. One, is there any research on the use of psychedelics for traumatic brain injury? Uh, you mentioned that there was, I think you mentioned that there was some neuron pathway growth in some of the uh, research, and I'm just curious about that. Um, I particularly have not seen any research on traumatic brain injury. That would be definitely a very interesting avenue to explore. One thing about traumatic brain injury is everybody, it, it, it's not, like, with depression, we can say somebody will feel a reduction and kind of going out and feel kind of confined to their bed, but with traumatic brain injury, a lot of people experience different effects from it, depending on which regions it affects. And actually, with traumatic brain injury, the brain is soft, nearly as soft as jello in your head. And whenever somebody gets hit, all these neurons get yanked and tugged and ripped out of different areas. So even if somebody does not necessarily feel an instant effect from it, these neurons being pulled out of different areas can cause changes in cognition, thoughts, behavior, moods over long periods of time. But based on the idea that it improves the growth of new neurons and new connections, it, there's, a good, there's a good chance it could be helpful, but again, I, I have not particularly seen research on that. Again, research in this field is fortunately really limited. It's, most of the studies are from the past five years, and uh, they're mostly focused on uh, mental disorders rather than physical abnormalities in the brain. Second part was, uh, you had mentioned that like uh, MDMA is particularly suited for PTSD and psilocybin for depressive disorders. Do each of those also help with uh, beyond that? So for instance, with MDMA, 
help not only with PTSD, but also depressive disorders and the same side of side. I believe yes. I, I believe yes. Um, this is, I'm just kind of bringing out what the research initiatives have been. So where a lot of research kind of uh, funding is going and where a lot of people are putting their time and effort into, but I absolutely believe that MDMA can help out with more. Like I said, it was a builder of the therapeutic alliance, and no matter what type of psychotherapy, if it's CBT, psychodynamic, um, DBT, you know, humanistic, transpersonal, any orientation of psychotherapy, it's the alliance that you have with your therapist. These are alliance building medications, so I do believe that this would be beneficial more than just psilocybin for depression and MDMA for PTSD. You, you spoke about that, that people are 20 years depressed, and, and was that simply just have the results based on just the taking of the, of the psilocybin dosage, or was there a in the integration afterwards, my particular interest would be about the effect of, of uh, uh, sort of a mindfulness meditation practice and, and along with that sort of uh, uh, microdosing. So in that particular study, it was only psilocybin, so it was no other types of interventions. But I definitely believe that mindfulness meditation could be a very useful intervention, especially when used with a psychedelic. I think that would have an amazing therapeutic potential. In fact, for um, my integrative medicine program, I just did a research project on, well, it was a systematic review, so I looked at research that has been published, and I looked at mindfulness meditation as a treatment for alcohol use disorder. And there's a lot of really amazing research that's going on right now around that. In fact, they're finding that mindfulness meditation has more long-term beneficial outcomes than CBT, which is the most common use therapy to treat alcohol use disorder currently. So. I think those kinds of medications, and also considering that mindfulness meditation has a very similar act on the brain that psychedelics do, I believe they would amplify each other and be very helpful. But that particular study was just psilocybin. Hi, Eric. You didn't mention the end of my how psychedelics help people that are in the end of my you did not mention that, but psychedelics are used to treat people, to help people uh, face the end of life. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I wish I had uh, two or three hours up here to just <laughs> talk about everything, but uh, that is definitely a very important one, um, especially Anthony Bossis is doing a lot of research on that right now, how psilocybin might be very beneficial for the end of life, and kind of the same principles that we see using for depression are kind of applied to the end of life treatment. Like people often find, um, with, especially with cancer, that they're scared of their body or they're angry. They're like, why is my own body killing me? Why is it ending my life? You know, and the idea that psilocybin helps people come to this terms of acceptiveness with their body. Like, I'm okay with who I am. Like, I am not my cancer. And it, uh, that's the idea that we are not our bodies. You know, we are something else, something more evolved than that. And if my body dies, that's okay, because I'm still here in one sense or another, and the experiences that I've had in my life. So thank you so much for bringing up that question. That is an amazing point. Um, Anthony Bosses is doing some great research on that, and I'll be sure to include that in my next second of time. Michael Coleman also. Absolutely, yeah, he's, he's great too. Definitely. Um, so, I, I, I see a bunch of people leaving, so I just want to say a few things before we all head out of here. we got another five minutes, so to stick around. Um, and I don't know if you want to keep doing the, the questions here, or maybe we can just go down to people who can come out here. Whatever, whatever yes. Yeah, okay. Whatever. So, um, so, yeah, just obviously thank you uh, to Aaron so much for, for all the work you've just done. Thank you all very much for coming out and supporting the Public Psychedelic Society. Uh, just made me so happy to, to have this happen here tonight. I'm so great. Um, the rest of the board, there's quite a few board members here, so if you guys could stand up. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm doing it with you. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you so much for having us here.
the education. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and then I also wanted to bring up um, some research that's going on in Portland. Uh, Gina, if you would stand up. Uh, Gina is a student journalist at PSU, and she's writing an article on the effects that psilocybin has on major depression. So if you have any experience, Gina is going to be at our merge table with her notebook, and she'll take your contact information and contact you for the article that she's writing. Um, we would really appreciate it if you could, if you could help her out. And thanks, Gina, for your research. Um, and then I just wanted to say a few things about, about events that are coming up. Um, I'm teaching a mushroom workshop this Sunday from 4 to 7. Uh, there are still some spots open through uh, Portland Psychedelic Society. Um, all the events can be found on the Meetup app, so you can go there and find out what's going on. There's the Men's Support Group on December 9th, and then the Elders Gathering on December 15th. Um, and so for further details, go to the Meetup app and check those out. Um, and once again, thank you everyone for coming out. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to, um, if you have more questions, Aaron will, will hang around. Uh, we probably have another 10 minutes here or so. Uh, and feel free, you know, connect with, with your fellow members of the Portland Psychedelic Society. Just one more time. Thank you so much for coming out here, everyone. Uh, for Touch Street Theater.